Hi, everybody. My name is Susanna Doyle, and I'm the Alumni Relations Manager at Trinity Development and Alumni. You're all very welcome to this week's Inspiring Ideas at Trinity webinar. Today, we are welcoming Professor Brendan Kelly, who is the author of Coping with Coronavirus, How to Stay Calm and Protect Your Mental Health, as well as Dr. Neve Farrelly, who is a consultant psychiatrist at the Trinity College Health Service. Uh, this week's webinar has been organized in partnership with Healthy Trinity, which is a cross-university partnership that aims to make it easy to be healthy in Trinity by engaging as many of our community as possible in promoting health. I wanted to welcome all of our staff, students, and alumni and friends to this week's webinar. We've had a uh, full registration for uh, this week's webinar, so it's wonderful to see how many of you are tuning in and interested in this topic, and it just shows the real strength and diversity of our Trinity community. Uh, before we get going, I wanted to quickly go through using Zoom and Facebook Live, uh, if you're not as familiar. For those of you who are watching in on Zoom, you can use the full screen view by clicking on the button on the top right of your screen. For those of you who need to adjust your audio settings, you can do that on the bottom left of your screen. If you need to leave the webinar today, you can do that on the bottom right. And if you'd like to ask any questions, please do by clicking on the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen and our presenters at the end of the talk will do their best to get to as many questions as possible. Sorry, for those of you who are using Facebook Live, you can mute and unmute your video. And again, if you have any questions that you'd like to um, send through, please do so and our speakers will do their best to get to those. Uh, so for today, there will be about 20 minutes uh, of presentation, uh, followed by uh, Q&A, and we plan to finish up by 2 p.m. Uh, this afternoon. Now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Neve Farrelly, who is a consultant psychiatrist for the College Health Service in Trinity. She has recently been acting medical director of the College Health Service and a member of the College Major Emergency Response Team, who has managed Trinity's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. She has worked in clinical psychiatry for the past 22 years. The last 12 have been um, here in Trinity as a consultant with students. Uh, she has a special interest in youth and student psychiatry, having completed her higher specialist training working in the university sectors of Cambridge and Harvard. So now let me uh, turn over to uh, Dr. Neve Farrelly. Thanks, Susanna. And I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar this afternoon. And I'm delighted to introduce to you all Professor Brendan Kelly. Professor Kelly has recently authored a publication called Coping with Coronavirus, How to Stay Calm and Protect Your Mental Health. This topic is the focus of our webinar this afternoon. Brendan is Professor of Psychiatry here at Trinity, and he works clinically as a consultant psychiatrist at Tally University Hospital. He has published extensively in the psychiatric, psychiatric literature, his interest being in the epidemiology of psychosis. He's a leading academic in the area of mental health legislation, and he has a particular interest in the rights of those with mental illness and the barriers they face in exercising those rights. Professor Kelly has published extensively and has authored a number of seminal pub publications to include Mental Health in Ireland, The Complete Guide, and Hearing Voices, The History of Psychiatry in Ireland, amongst others. He, along with Professor, Professor Patricia Casey, co-authored the third edition of Fisher's Clinical Psychopathology, which is regarded worldwide as the Bible for medical students and trainees in psychiatry alike, and will be familiar to many. I think it's particularly important for me to highlight Professor Kelly's other areas of expertise, which are extensive, and to add another dimension to this talk that transcends psychiatry. He holds masters in epidemiology and healthcare management, and counts doctorates in law, history, and Buddhism amongst his accolades. He marries this wealth of knowledge seamlessly into his book, Coping with the Coronavirus. Brendan has notably awarded Dr. Ada English her rightful place in both history and medicine in his publication, Ada English, Patriot and Psychiatrist, and he's published on shell shock and its treatment at Dublin's Richmond Hospital. His interest in mindfulness is documented in his book, The Doctor Who Sat for a Year. Brendan is also a much acclaimed public speaker and given his range of interest much of this afternoon could probably be given over discussing a broad range of topics 
We are, however, limited to talking for just an hour, and I look forward to hearing Brendan and his thoughts in relation to coping with coronavirus and the times in which we are living at the moment. So I'll hand over now. Great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Niamh. Um, and thank you very much, everyone, for uh, for uh, tuning in this afternoon. And um, thank you for you know your interest in this topic, which is clearly a topic that is um, you know concerning for all of us. And there's uh, you know a lot of a lot of public interest in this, a lot of concern, a lot of worry, and it's probably the most difficult time that any of us have had to navigate in our lives uh, as a people, as a community you know, as a society. So um, what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is ways that we can manage ourselves, ways that we can uh, try to try to look after the anxiety that we experience, look after ourselves and look after each other. So I've got, a, got some presenta a presentation here that I'm going to talk through, um, which I will now uh, put up on the screen. I'm hoping. Um, uh, I will try and do that um, if I am able to, which I don't seem to be able to. Um, uh, okay, so we can try and share my screen now if that's possible um, so that I can talk through some of what I have to say. Um, but that's just uh, uh, not happening for me at the moment. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, talk a little bit firstly, uh, just talk through some of the main themes and maybe some of my colleagues can get me a share my screen uh, function, which I just cannot find. Um, so um, as soon as coronavirus became apparent um, at the end of last year, the start of this year, it was obvious that we were going to have two big problems. The first problem was clearly the illness caused by coronavirus itself. And I think the second problem is the anxiety and the panic that it generates. And I, I think it's very important to, to, to reflect on the fact that people have very different uh, experiences of this. So I know now, even as I speak with you, that uh, many people um, out there have been bereaved. They've lost a loved one or a family member or a friend. There are other people who are ill and being, being treated in hospital or at home. And there are yet more people who haven't been directly affected by the illness, but are consumed by anxiety, by worry and by changes in, in all of our lives. Um, I'm, I'm talking to you from home, for example, since like many people, I work from home as much as is possible uh, in my job. So bearing in mind all of these different um, perspectives, I'm going to go through some of the um, some of the um, uh, concerns that people have. And I think I have just figured out how to share my screen, which is um, which is wonderful. Um, there we go. So. Um, so I'm going to talk through some of the themes here from uh, a book which I've just written called Coping with Coronavirus. And it's a um, basically a psychological toolkit and you can download it from Amazon or from Merion Press or you can buy it around the place. But what I really want to talk about are five areas, if I might. I want to talk about managing our knowledge, managing what we think, how we feel, and then what we what we can do um, what we what we can change in our lives. So I'm going to talk for about 15 more minutes and uh, run through these main themes. Now, the big message I have is that while COVID-19 COVID or coronavirus can seem so big and uncontrolled, there are elements of this situation that we can control. We have more power uh, than we feel we have. And it's easy to fall into uh, uh, a situation of what we might call worst case thinking or uh, untrammeled anxiety and we need to take small steps that will help us control that so that that's what I'm going to run through if that's okay and I'm going to start with the idea of knowledge and this is perhaps what makes this outbreak or epidemic different to, to previous ones which is we have so much information available to us now on the internet and in social media in all kinds of channels so um, 
we need to manage that. Information is incredibly powerful and we need to watch how we consume information. It is perfectly possible to spend hours and hours every day updating uh, websites, looking at statistics from other countries, basically following virtually every single case as it's diagnosed around the world. This is not helpful. So what I advise uh, about this is that we tune into the global pandemic, that is to say national or international statistics just twice a day in, on, on the computer or on our phones or whatever, 15 minutes in the morning, 15 in the evening, and between times we focus on COVID-19 only to the extent that it affects our lives, only to the extent that it affects us. We cannot spend every hour of every day carrying the weight of this global pandemic on our own shoulders. We're not built for it um, and there's no benefit to it. So a really important number one piece of advice here is to stay informed about the outbreak but don't obsess every minute of every day about the global picture. Limit that to twice a day. Otherwise, we just simply can't cope. And, and that's probably one of my more important points. Because we're so interested in the uh, information about this, and because there are gaps, we, we tend to fill those gaps. So very often we use social media to um, fill knowledge gaps with uh, speculation and conspiracy theories. And our minds are so funny about this. We, our minds somehow go to seek out the most outrageous, most unlikely conspiracy theories that we can find. We look for the worst case scenario of when it ends and how, and that goes into our, into our minds. And what's really interesting is, even if we don't believe what we read, it has an impact, it has an emotional impact on us. So we need to resist this temptation to fill our knowledge gaps with speculation or random musings on social media. And even if we don't believe them, they do pack an emotional punch. So managing our use of social media and other forms of communication is very, very important. And this also gives us a responsibility and um, so, you know, if we come across material that is questionable, we shouldn't amplify it by sending it onward, even with question marks or things like this, because we're just amplifying the effect, the emotional effect of um, false information. So that's the second point I want to make about knowing things. And perhaps the third one is we should reflect upon ourselves and how we use information. Um, to, be, to, to be more precise, we need to look at what our information sources are and what we do with the information we have and how, how we respond to it because managing that flow is um is very important um, knowing ourselves also matters in terms of recalibrating some of our expectations so we, we got a lot of questions in prior to today's webinar and it's interesting quite a number of them relate to um changed circumstances, people responding to working from home a lot, or even more to the point, spending a lot of time at home. Um, and the tensions that this produces in households or with neighbours, but we need to recalibrate a little bit. The annoyances of home are different to the annoyances of work, but they're probably no more or no less for most people. Um, but we need to cultivate a sort of awareness of that. Uh, this is a different circumstance. We need to know that and recalibrate a little bit. Okay, so that, that's to do with knowledge, one of my five areas today. The second area where I want to talk about coping with anxiety is to do with our th thoughts. Now, we know that around 90% of all human behaviour is habit. This includes the way we think, what we do and how we feel. So if we can somehow manage our thinking habits that little bit better, even 10% better, that will make an enormous difference to the amount of anxiety we feel. And this, a lot of this, this section of the book, when I write about this, it comes from cognitive behaviour therapy, which is um, the use of our thoughts, cognitions and our behaviours to change our response to various situations. Now, one of the interesting things about cognitive behaviour therapy is that when, when we're 
using it to treat, say, panic disorder or anxiety. We're basically teaching the person that there is um, nothing that um, they should be afraid of that their anxiety has fundamentally no basis. So someone with panic attacks in a supermarket, we um, teach them that um, panic uh, in, for in a supermarket doesn't have a basis. Um, but now it's different because of course there is something to be anxious about. So we need to adapt our methods that little bit from cognitive therapy to, to look at our current situation because there is indeed reason to be anxious and we, we, we can't deny that. The first and biggest thought that we need to put to the forefront of our minds is that we have more control over this situation than we think. Or to, to put it slightly differently, you might feel you have very little control over the global pandemic, over what's happening in the US, what's happening in Africa, in China, and all of this. However, if you shift your frame and look at your own life, or you know that of your immediate family, there are many areas where we do have control. And this is very important to focus on. Now, particularly those of you with children, um, you'll instinctually understand the importance of this because for children, so many things seem overwhelming anyway, but particularly this. And um, we should talk to children about this, very clearly talk to children about it, uh, about that there's a new problem with a new illness, but then we need immediately to focus on what they can control. So what can the children do? They can go and wash their hands immediately. So if we can if we can link the global picture with concrete actions in areas we can control, it benefits everybody. Um, the second point I want to make, it relates to uh, thinking habits um, or thinking behaviors. Now this has fundamentally to do with uh, the way we uh, process thoughts rapidly in our heads. Some of the unhelpful habits that we read about in cognitive behavior therapy include um, things like uh, negative automatic thoughts. So negative automatic thoughts are thinking habits that immediately move us to the, to the negative in everything. So that um, we might hear something, but we will then relate it to our own lives in a negative way. So perhaps the most common example of this is if we hear that um, you know, COVID-19 cases have increased or decreased by 5% or 10% that we immediately assume we will, we will get COVID-19. In point of fact, such statistics don't really make um, a huge difference in terms of personal risk, but we over-interpret and over-apply negative statistics. So we need to be aware of that. Along with another, another habit is called a negative filter. This is where we filter out any good news and we only focus on negative news. And this is a very, very common thing that we all do at the best of times. But this uh, tendency is amplified hugely at a time like this. So being aware of this cognitive filter helps uh, greatly with our routine management of our thinking. And the final thing I want to say about thinking is that at a time when we're very worried as individuals, it is very mentally healthy if we can think of other people and actively think of other people at a time like this. So, for example, whatever risk we're facing here, um, and I, I'm in Ireland, I realise maybe not all of you are, but if we take the example of Ireland, which is a rich country in global terms, whatever risk I'm facing here is much smaller than the risk faced in countries that are poor, countries with poor health systems, poor nutrition, poor sanitation and putting our own personal risk into context like this consciously every day helps us if you like contextualize our worries that little bit more and um, i was once at a meditation weekend where the exercise at the end of each day was that we thought about ourselves and the size of us the size of me uh, compared to the size of the world or think of me as one person in a world of billions of people and the message there isn't that I don't matter, it's that everyone else matters just as much as I do, and there are billions of them out there. So in terms of thinking, it's really good. We focus on what we can control, and that hugely helps us when we set aside what we can't control. We keep a little eye on our tendencies towards negative thinking. Our minds are somehow built to go off in negative directions. And then it helps if we can, if you like, dilute our self-concern by thinking of other people and thinking of the world as big. 
The next area I want to mention is about feelings and emotions. And these are commonly ignored in, in many psychological um, pieces of psychological advice, but feelings determine a great deal of what we do. And the first piece of advice is to be aware of them. In other words, that we would be conscious of when we're feeling happy, when we're feeling irritated, when we're feeling sad. And certainly with irritation, we often feel very irritated over very minor things. So being aware of that is a very important and exceptionally useful habit to get into. So if you're feeling annoyed, it's good to have a little think about why you're feeling annoyed and particularly what media have you consumed during the day, because that will have built up silently. And um, even if you didn't believe what you read, it does contribute to our to our feelings. The other thing that happens us at a time like this is we confuse our feelings with facts. So we might think, um, you know, everything is getting worse. Um, and uh, we would take that as a fact. But if we reflect on it a little bit, it might be that we had a bad day. And it might be that the global pandemic is not in fact getting worse. We confused that with us having a bad day. And this is very natural, we do it all the time. We confuse our own life story with what's happening in the world, as if the entire world moves in unison with how we feel, and it doesn't. So emotions can disguise themselves as facts, um, or we can behave in ways that are in fact emotions rather than logical behaviors. And that's something we need to remain aware of, again, particularly um, at the moment. And the final point here is talking about emotions, which is very, very important. But there's a caveat there in that we do need to label them as emotions. So this means, you know, telling someone, for example, that you feel as if everything is getting worse, rather than telling somebody everything is getting worse, because it might not be. This might be a feeling that you have, which is really important, and really important to share, but it's not a fact. And we affect each other so profoundly we are built for communication as humans. And if we are anxious, or if we say everything is getting worse, that's what the other person hears. But if we label it as our feelings, our emotions, um, that's quite a different transaction, different conversation going on there. So it's good to be aware of these feelings and these emotions. Now, in the questions and answers, we're gonna talk about the practical application of some of these ideas. So, so we will get to that in just a couple of minutes. The second last thing I want to talk about is doing and our behaviours. We, you know, particularly with anxiety, it's not always possible to think your way out of anxiety. Uh, sometimes we need to do things. Um, or, uh, uh, as, as I put it in the book, there are times when we need to simply shut the laptop, leave the phone behind and go outside if we're allowed to go outside um, or just do something else. The key is to do something rather than um, try to think our way through everything, which isn't always possible. The first thing we need to do is follow the public health advice that the government or the World Health Organization, or if you're in the United States, the CDC provide. These people, they know what they're talking about. And we must make a conscious decision to trust the public health experts and follow the advice. Their advice might change. And I, we were seeing a very good example of this, I think, with the evolving advice about face coverings, where um, certainly the World Health Organization is clear that wearing medical face masks in public is not recommended, but the CDC in the US holds the position that face coverings like scarves and that might be helpful. And the important thing is to follow this advice as it evolves. If it changes, um, that simply means the knowledge has changed. And there's enormous comfort to be had when you make the decision to trust and follow the public health advice. Um, so it's important to do things that help, uh, but not do things that don't. Obviously doing other things is important as well, um, and not to let our lives be entirely dominated by coronavirus. So um, we obviously need to watch our uh, diet um, our sleep patterns. We should try to sleep eight hours a night, very difficult with our altered work arrangements and, and so forth, but we need to make efforts. And also exercise is tremendously important. About 150 minutes of vigorous exercise a week is what's recommended. And the final thing here is to reward ourselves for when we, when we do things well. This is a really tough time. It's maybe the hardest time that most people will face in their entire lives. You know, if you are saving up for a rainy day, this is it. 
this is the rainy day. So reward yourself and be compassionate towards yourself um, when you, um, you know, when you're feeling, feeling you've had a really bad time, a really bad day. And we need to be gentle with others as well. A number of the queries that came in, some, some, some expressed great frustration with other people. Um, and I know people are frustrated with those who don't follow the public health guidelines, people who um, are not considerate when they're living in apartment complexes, they're making noise and so forth. We need to be compassionate towards ourselves when we become irritated and towards others. Some people are having a really, really hard time of this and they're not doing what they should. So the final section in what I want to talk about is just to do with being and this idea about ourselves and what this whole episode tells us about who we are. The first thing that's really clear, if we ever had any doubt, is that we struggle with proportionality. So we tend to either be complacent about a risk or panicked. But with this, we need to land somewhere in the middle where there is something to be anxious about but we must not be disabled by that anxiety. And our brains aren't really good at this unless we try very hard to focus on it. So proportionality of anxiety is vital and it's somewhat difficult for us to achieve. Now, for some people, coronavirus is dominating their lives because they, um, they are ill with it. They have a family member who has died or is ill with it, and that's fair enough. And it's difficult for them um, but for many people, the anxiety they have is to do with being at home, not being able to work and a bit uncertain about the future. For, for those people, we should not project other life problems onto coronavirus. So I see some people slipping into a habit of thinking that everything was perfect prior to this outbreak and that everything will be perfect again soon enough. That's not true. There were problems beforehand, there'll be problems after. This is the biggest problem and we we are starting to understand the shape and the size of it, and it will be overcome beyond doubt. Um, but we need to keep it in that perspective. This is not necessarily an existential crisis for humanity. It's a public health problem, a big one, but it's a public health problem that needs to be solved. And uh, the final point obviously is to do with that uh, being with other people. There are some very interesting ideas in Buddhism about um, the idea of non-self. And this is a really interesting teaching that says that, that the idea of the self, say me, is not as firm as I imagine it. Um, I'm changing all the time, everybody is. Um, so I'm not the fixed immutable entity and neither are other people. We're in much closer communication. And there's an argument, and I go into this in the book, that we should consider all of humanity as a single organism. And if this outbreak shows anything, it is the depth of those connections. The fact that this is a problem that, that spreads between people, among people, and can only be solved when we consider ourselves as a single unit fighting together, or, or responding together rather, um, to coronavirus. So they're, they're the main points that I wanted to say. Um, uh, as I said, we will talk about some of the more some of the detail here um, in uh, in the questions and answers in a few moments. And uh, if you're looking for more information, clearly um, there's all kinds of stuff online, lots of resources on the Trinity website, and you can also download this um, little book that I wrote, which only costs you a euro, and any proceeds are going to the Irish Red Cross. The Red Cross are doing fantastic work. Um, in the Irish response to coronavirus and also more broadly around the world. So it's, 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 it's a really good cause um, and uh, the Irish Red Cross really uh, need the support. So with that in mind, I am going to now try, hopefully with more success than last time, to uh, stop sharing my screen and see what happens then. Okay, I think I've stopped sharing my screen. Thanks, Brendan. So that was very good, even with the technical glitches. So I'm just going to start off a little bit with your first slide that you shared with us, which was about the whole concept of knowing and about the issue with regard to, let's say, information mindfulness, as you put it in the book, and how our consumption of media can silently impact and affect our mood and trying to develop an ability to be mindful about what we're reading. And that kind of seems to resonate with a lot of people. And even in my own case, having read the book, I kind of started to think about what, what I was looking at and what I was reading. And even though reading of the daily stats on coronavirus 
Um, they're not particularly difficult for me because it forms part of my day-to-day -day work and I'm expected to do it and I can incorporate that into my coping strategies and mechanisms. But what I do see myself reading and being drawn towards repeatedly would be kind of articles about family members who can't be together with somebody's unwell or people who visit, you know, not able to visit nursing homes or poetry written by people who are who have lost somebody as a consequence of coronavirus. And I'm, I won't say I'm addicted to these articles, but I'm very definitely drawn to them in, in a disproportionate fashion. And I suppose I find that I'm very upset having read them. My mood is down. It really impacts on me. I have to kind of pull myself together to get on with the day. So I think that whole area of sort of information and mindfulness, being aware of, of, um, of what we're consuming is, is really, really important. So maybe you could just speak a little bit more around that concept. Yeah, the, the, the articles that you describe, the, you know, the human stories are so emotional and they are so affecting. And the fact we're affected by them is, is really, really positive, because if we lose that sense of empathy, um, then our response to coronavirus will be so much the weaker. Um, but we do need to ration it, um, you know, quite, quite severely. Um, in relation to that. And uh, I would certainly include such highly emotional material within what I recommend to be just sort of two 15 minutes at the start and at the end of the day. Um, because for many of us, those stories are going to come into our lives as well. They won't just be on the on, on the computer or in the, in the newspaper. They're going to be friends of ours or family members. So we need to ration that right down. And that's not being cruel. It's not being distant. It's being reasonably self-protective so that we don't become disabled. I mean, all the people affected by this depend on others, um, um, you know, other people, community in general, to be able to respond. Like we all depend on the Gardaí to be doing their job, the army to be doing theirs, the healthcare workers, we depend on everyone. Um, and the people we really depend upon, and I, I wanna make this point strongly, is the people who are obeying the public health advice, particularly the over 70s, many of whom are very frustrated now. Um, but we really need them not to be disheartened uh, by anything they read or do, and to understand that they are by cocooning, they are absolutely the frontline workers in controlling coronavirus. And they need really to congratulate themselves for, we all want to do something, go out there and help actively. But anyone over 70 who is cocooning and is watching this now, I can tell you that you are a frontline worker in controlling the spread of coronavirus. I think that brings us on to sort of another question that has come in and that's sort of um it sort of picks on up on the theme of empowerment that you spoke about and control and control over how we cope and control over how we deal with things and um um how it sort of are uh, you know using a collective view of humanity how that then will, it will facilitate control and then that then feeds into sort of the whole notion of communication and how we communicate with one another, particularly with children and adolescents. But we've had a very interesting question in um, about somebody who writes about a family member who is in their 30s, who has a language, language disorder and autistic features. And this person does not seem to listen to mainstream media, has not, does not seem to have absorbed public health advice around hand hygiene or cough etiquette. And when family members try to speak to this individual, they become very, very aggressive. So this person is wondering about advice on how to structure a calm and reasonable conversation in this kind of scenario. So th th this is the que this question comes up very very frequently. Um, trying to communicate with people who have limited language abilities, people who have communication problems, and if you like, these are the regular problems people encounter with such communication. But they have added emotional weight at the moment because of you know, simply the amount of anxiety. But the, the, I mean, the usual principles apply, which is that despite the difficulties of the conversations, you do go ahead and have, have the conversations. The person becoming hostile in their manner probably reflects general emotionality rather than actual ill will. Um, and it reflects emotional intensity. So there's a certain amount of that to be, to be gone through uh, and simply to be tolerated. Um, it's important to keep these conversations short uh, to keep these conversations relatively focused on uh, practical things that can be done. 
I mean, none of us can really grasp in our heads the enormity of a global pandemic. Like, it's just hard. So people who have any kind of psychological difficulties or intellectual disabilities will struggle with that even more. But it's something most of us can't do anyway. Um, and finally, we need to uh, change our expectations. Sometimes something that we respond to very emotionally, other people um, with, who are neurodevelopmentally different will respond to very differently. So we do need to tolerate that. We won't achieve 100% agreement on our response to things. So certainly have the conversations, be mindful and compassionate with yourself in understanding they won't go 100% the way you want. Short conversations focused on concrete actions. And even if it doesn't seem to have gone well to you, you don't know how it went for the other person. It might have delivered a lot of benefit, even if you don't feel it at the time. I think a lot of people are probably struggling with that. And also with adolescents, you know, adolescents really struggling with kind of having to comply with being at home. It's hard enough to be at home as an adolescent in the best, best of times, but, you know, to be kind of forced and not being able to see friends, that, that can be quite difficult for them. We have another very pragmatic question in, um, which is it's around um, routine formation and asking for advice on what might be the best way to establish routine, in particular getting started in the morning. The lack of routine seems to be precipitating a downward spiral of low motivation and frustration. And this is certainly something that I'm seeing in clinical practice at the moment, particularly with students as they're kind of heading into their exam assessment period next week. And um, the whole loss of the college routine and structure to the day really is having a profound impact on people. So that's, that's a very pertinent question for, my, for me, for my population yeah. here. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a very interesting one because, you know, technically we're all capable of forming our own routines and uh, we should try to adhere to routine as best we can. But so many people struggle with it. I'm very interested in the uh, approach of many of the secondary schools here, which have started um, teaching um, according to a school timetable at home. So we're seeing children getting up at half eight in the morning and sitting at their computers and sending messages right through till two or three in the afternoon uh, when school ends. So what, what, you know, I was doing a talk about this and something that uh, one person said is that what really makes your day work out is if you get up in the morning, make your bed and phone your friend so that you're putting a tiny little bit of social pressure on yourself and your colleagues so that uh, you make some kind of a commitment that at 9 a.m. each morning you will phone a named friend and that both of you will be up. And um, that's the kind of uh, peer pressure or social pressure that we respond to far more than our internal motivations because I mean, we all let ourselves down when we don't have a little bit of uh, a little bit of pressure uh, or, or structure things. So we have a small amount of peer pressure going on. So if we can try and get a little bit of um, pressure or communication with friends to motivate you and get you up, you're far more likely uh, to be successful. The other thing is to make sort of deals with yourself about uh, treats like uh, coffee and biscuits and things like this, that you'll only allow them to yourself if you get up at a certain time. And oddly, this motivation works for a lot of people, even though they could violate it if they wished and nobody would know, we do make deals with ourselves. So we need to use those psychological tricks to maintain our function and our wellness. Yeah, and um, you know, I see, I see with our students here who have had, um, who have live lecture, you know, but their ability to maintain routine has been just so much easier for them. So that's something that we might learn in, in time, you know, if something like this were to occur again, these might be some of the, le the learning outcomes we have. Um, we've had a couple of questions that sort of marry the whole idea of being and humanity uh, kind of an amalgamation into that kind of general question but the restrictions we've had over the past six weeks have really um shed shone a light really on you know heretofore we would have thought about where we have to go and who we have to be and what we have to do and now all of a sudden we're kind of confronted with with our own humanity and um i suppose just this is an opportunity where we have to maybe sometimes reflect on that and ask ask that question of ourselves so what do you kind of think it means to be human at this time? Well, this is tremendously interesting because I was talking with someone and I said, you know, what's the most difficult part of this? Is it being at home with your family? And he said, no, no, it's being at home with myself. Yeah. This is, you know, the most scary bit of it. Um, and this uh, sort of being confronted with the reality 
which is that we don't stick to routines. Like we all think we do, but in fact we don't. And that we think we're self-motivators and in fact most of us aren't. We respond to even the slightest bit of peer pressure rather than self-motivation. Um, th these are hugely important lessons um, for us to learn. Um, but the biggest problem is that we can get too much of ourselves um, at a time like this. So one of the big pieces of advice I have in the book is that we try and turn off ourselves for a period of time every day because no one no one can be with anyone let alone yourself for that period of time so one of the pieces of advice is that um we get into this state of absorption that some people who are listening and watching will be familiar with let's say if you go running and after a little while of running it's like all your everything just disappears and there's only the movement and the feeling of your feet on the pavement and everything's gone some people describe the same experience when they're swimming for example. Um, now, obviously, a lot of people can't go out, but I was doing a, a talk once about mindfulness and meditation and letting the world melt away and letting yourself go. And a woman came up to me at the end and said that I was totally wrong and that the solution was knitting. And she said that when she knits, um, all of life disappears. It's like she's not there. There is only the movement of the needles. So. She said knitting is even better than anything I described because not only do you have a period of absorption in the present moment of pure mindfulness, um, but you also have a jumper or a scarf by the time you're finished. So perhaps the best answer to this is that we can have too much of ourselves at the best of times, particularly now. So we need to find an activity that makes that melt away, gets us into this state of flow or absorption and then we'll be better able to face ourselves an hour later when, when we're back to reality. So we've lots and lots of questions coming in, so just trying to sift through them there a little bit. Um, and again, just kind of trying to pick up on themes really as much as anything else. And one of the themes that arises commonly in clinical psychiatry, uh, generally speaking, but also in our daily lives, is developing an ability to tolerate or sit with distress and kind of try and understand it and I suppose a lot of people spend a lot of their lives trying to negate stress or make it go away through whatever mechanism, some, some of them harmful, some of them not. Um, somebody's written in a question asking, is it possible to manage stress if you aren't sure what's stressing you? So they say they had a disproportionate reaction to a minor setback last week, which could probably be ascribed to stress. But was the stress COVID-19 related because they had a glitch when they were working at home? Or was it arising out of a difficulty in a family relationship that had been historically difficult but is okay now at the moment? So they're kind of wondering where this kind of reaction came from. Yeah, and we do, we always wonder where our reactions come from. It, it's a very human thing, but I'm not certain it's always successful. So, you know, whenever we're stressed or anxious, we do try and figure out a cause. And I, I know you see this yourself all the time, Niamh, when people come in with problems and they really need an explanation. And if there isn't a ready explanation, they, they kind of come up with one anyway. And mm -hmm. uh, they blame it on something from the very distant past or on their current circumstances. And I think this questioner clearly has a number of reasons why they might be anxious or stressed or find things difficult. But we need to live with an amount of uncertainty about that. And, um, you know, we might not always be able to explain why we feel the way we feel. And we need to nonetheless deal with the feelings. I was talking once with, of all things, a surfer, someone who does a lot of surfing. And I was talking to him about waves. And I said, do you understand about waves? And he said, partly. He said, I only partly understand the waves, but I need to surf them anyway so that, he, that we need to get through these things with sometimes only a partial understanding of why we feel how we feel. Um, and we should deal with the problems that we identify, but we should accept that we cannot 100% explain our feelings. So it's really hard to attribute uh, feelings to specific causes uh, if it's not very, very clear. Um, so sometimes we need to live with a lot of uncertainty about how we feel the way we feel, and if you like, just just deal with it as best we can um, the way out of a trap is not always the way you got into it um, and that's important to remember now when we have free floating anxiety in any case um, we have another question here which again is an interesting one because it's something that that kind of marries two things but there's a question from somebody asking about um, 
how to cope when they're pregnant during the time of coronavirus and, and any advice on how they might cope with that. And I think that question is an interesting one because it marries both concern about themselves, but also about, about the baby. And I think that's, that's a nice question. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's one of these um, uh, sort of questions that causes infinite worry, be, you know, because it concerns another human life for which, um, you know, the pregnant person is responsible. Um, in terms of medical care and concern, the HSE website has a section on pregnancy and coronavirus in terms of, you know, um, precautions and care and so forth. In terms of the psychology of it, um, it, it I suppose the first thing to remember is that, uh, you know, following the public health advice is even more important. Um, when you're pregnant because there are additional responsibilities. However, there is no clear evidence that there is particular additional risk in relation to pregnancy at this time. So it is not a cause for hysteria or for infinite worry. In, in operational terms, day-to-day -day terms, uh, the pregnant person is in somewhat the same boat as everybody else in the sense that you follow the public health advice and um, you know, avoid going out as much as possible and avoid trying to let the worry the extra worry that you're inevitably going to feel. Avoid letting that slip out of control. Um, there is very good advice on the HSE website about uh, care during pregnancy. And I think the self-care that we're talking about here is even more important because there is this feeling of additional responsibility. Um, but, but, uh, but as I said, the public health advice applies equally. And once you're doing that, there is no reason to feel more anxious than the next person. None. Again, lots of questions again, but again, another sort of question that, that goes back to your very, your opening, your opening step sentence really, and what I think is really important to come back to. Somebody's asking on advice for people who've recently lost a family member and where everything about the virus now looks amplified for them and, and really how, the, how, they, how they might cope. Yeah, I mean, I have the, such like enormous sympathy for people who have lost uh, family members, people who have ill family members. And um, I think one of the one of the vital things to remember here is that grief and grieving at this time will be different to grief and grieving at other times, because, you know, um, many people don't get the opportunity to say goodbye in the way that they would like to have done. They don't get the opportunity to um, have all the usual rituals be it um, in churches, uh, burials, be it social rituals, which means so much at funerals, um, we, do, we, we don't get these. So people are to expect certainly that their grieving process will be uh, longer than usual and will be more complex than usual. And this moves us towards having compassion towards yourself and towards your family members at this time. This is harder um, than usual. And it's even more complex by the fact that many people who are bereaved are also self-isolating because of possibly being close contacts and some of them are also ill. So we need to be absolutely clear in our heads. This is probably the most difficult time that these people will ever face in their entire lives. And all of us need to be uh, aware of that and they themselves need to be fully aware of that and to support each other. The other thing to say though is that as humans we can navigate grief and distress at this level. We have always been able to do so and while the future might seem like coronavirus is amplified beyond all control, we focus on today and we focus on tomorrow. We don't think about next week, next month or next year. So for people particularly in these states of heightened concern and anxiety and bereavement, we need to look at the present moment, very short time frames, and we need to let ourselves grieve for the people who have died, for the effects on our families, and more broadly for the effect of the whole, the whole outbreak on society. We need more time, more space, um, and more compassion for ourselves and others. But we can get through this. Humans get through extraordinary things, and we get through this as well. You know, self-compassion is very important, really. Um, another question that's coming in, and again, I can identify a little bit with it. How can you give advice for parents of teenagers who miss their friends and their social lives and who are, who are really struggling with that? How can we kind of cope and, and help those the teenagers to cope? So, so this, is a really, this is a really tough one because it's, it's so difficult to understand 
teenagers when you're not a teenager anymore. Uh, it's, it's almost impossible. However, um, teenagers, um, once we encourage them to connect with their friends as best as possible, that makes a big difference. But the biggest thing um, for teenagers is that we set a good example ourselves in what we do. We know that younger children watch us and behave like us, but teenagers do too. They're even more sensitive to our own behaviours. So the best way we can support teenagers is by setting a good example in the way that we manage our knowledge, in our behaviour, our exercise and our general attitude. And we also need to get teenagers to shorten their, their, their time horizons. They're often thinking about the world and life and these big issues, and this time is not a time for thinking about these big things. We need to think about short, short term issues and we need to support teenagers as they do that, support them as they contact friends as best as possible and try to set a good example for them with our own behaviour. Because even though it doesn't seem like that some days, to be honest, uh, they do watch what we do and um, they do turn out like us. And that's the thing about children. There is this glorious and terrifying moment when you realise your children are turning out like you. Thought. Sorry, Neve, just to say we've got about uh, five more minutes of questions. Okay. So maybe I might just come to a question there. I see, which is, again, something that, that's a very real thing for, for very many people. Um, it's saying we're 75 and our daughters and granddaughters live a 10 minute drive away, but it's six weeks since we've had a hug. One 10 second hug will contribute so much to our emotional well-being. How do we overcome this? Well, I mean, that, that's, that's so difficult to overcome. Um, and we need to accept that that's a form of emotional connection that we are not going to have um, for a period of time. And that is a very, very harsh reality. Um, there are good reasons for that. And I know that the questioner, undoubtedly their logical brain understands that this, what they're describing, that's sort of, it's almost like a fantasy scene, what they're describing cannot happen. But our emotional brains are lagging way behind our logical brains. And that, that is simply how it is. We just need to reiterate to ourselves, almost like a mantra, that following the public health advice keeps everybody safer. Uh, and there are, you know, I mean, people are giving each other hugs across uh, FaceTime and uh, all kinds of devices. And that's really good. But let's be honest as well. It's nothing like a real life hug. It just isn't. But we have to come to terms with that as one of the things we have lost uh, for now. And we have to place that in the context of other people's losses. There are people who are bereaved. They've had, you know, family members die. There are people in intensive care units. So everyone is losing something now. Um, and we need to put our own losses into context, not downplaying them in, a, in any way. Do our best with other forms of um, technology and so forth and other forms of reaching out. But ultimately, we need to acknowledge there are things we have lost here. We will regain them. But for now, we have lost them. And we may have time for a final quick question. It's, a, it's probably a long answer, but um, so there's been a couple of questions here about people asking about how the practice or if the practice of psychiatry has changed since the onset of COVID-19 or if there's been a notable increase in psychiatric presentations. There's a few questions of that nature. Well, um, I suppose the short answer is no. Um, because um, psychiatry has seen um, what most parts of medical, ser medical services and health services have seen, which is a huge decline in people presenting um, because people tend to be very anxious about clinics and hospitals, worried about catching COVID-19 or thinking that things aren't open. In fact, mental health services are running. They're a little bit altered. We do a lot of assessments by telephone, but they are still running. So people with mental health problems will need to uh, present anyway. Um, the question about the longer term is more interesting because people talk about an epidemic of mental health problems being stored up following uh, this whole event. And, um, you know, evidence from other similar events around the world are very clear that even with something this large, people cope best by relying on friends and family once they know that the door is open to mental health services if they need it in due course. So I think we are going to see some more in the future. Um, but for now, psychiatry is part of this general um, 
a decrease in people presenting for health services uh, mm-hmm. and uh, but but there's so much else so much people can do to maintain mental health um during this period uh, things like staying connected and doing various online activities uh, i think online yoga has shot up in popularity um but uh, but mental health services still do exist for sure and they are still available for those who need them yeah. so i think we're, we're out of time um, I'd like to thank Professor Brendan Kelly for his expertise and for giving us this time. And just again to reiterate that the royalties from his book are going to the Irish Red Cross. Um, thanks to all our audience for their participation, to Ali Hartney, Susanna Doyle, Colin Halloran from the Alumni Office for facilitating the webinar. And I would like to give a special thanks to Martina Mullen, our Health Promotion Officer here at Trinity, who proposed this webinar and who brought the whole thing to fruition. And I'd also encourage you all to check out the Healthy Wind Trinity website, which has got lots of great resources where to find Professor Kelly's book, but also other resources, particularly for Trinity students, um, that, that, are, that can be very helpful and supportive in terms of, in terms of supporting themselves through COVID-19. Um, and these include uh, mindfulness uh, workshops and, and lots of resources. So, so please do check that out. And thanks again, Brendan, for, for your time. Thank you both. This has been such a fantastic presentation. There's so many questions um, that have come in. It really shows uh, the importance of this topic. Um, so we really appreciate your time here. Um, I just wanted to uh, finish up with a, a couple of next steps. Um, again, for those of you who are interested in uh, purchasing Coping with Coronavirus, you can find it as an ebook on kobu.com. Google Books or Amazon.co.uk um, or on paperback and Amazon. And again, all the royalties from the book will be going to the Irish Red Cross. Uh, if you like more information about Trinity Development and Alumni, you have any questions about the webinar, please contact us at alumni at tcd.ie. And again, Neve has provided the information about uh, the Health Through Trinity website. Um, I also just wanted to mention, because we do have a number of students who registered for today's webinar, um, to, um, to check out Trinity Alumni Online. This is our online portal. It has uh, 6,000 plus uh, alumni and students on it. And you can find alumni mentors there that might be able to support you with career advice, placement, uh, postgraduate advice. And I think now, uh, especially while we're all uh, working from home and we don't have the kind of day-to-day and in-person uh, connections. This is a really great opportunity to connect with alumni mentors. Um, for those of you who are alumni who are listening in and you haven't yet joined, uh, you're very welcome to do so. And I think it really is just that great opportunity to support our students um, at this time. To uh, mention next week's Inspiring Ideas at Trinity webinar, it will be taking place on April 29th at 7.30 p.m. and the topic will be innovating in times of crisis, how Trinity's young entrepreneurs are adapting their businesses. So we hope to see you next week. Uh, And that is in partnership with Trinity Business uh, Alumni. And I wanted to thank all of you attendees for listening in today. Again, a big thank you to Professor Kelly and Dr. Farrelly for an excellent presentation. And a thank you to the team who's helped to make Uh, this presentation uh, and webinar happen. And we look forward to welcoming you all next week. In the meantime, uh, please stay safe. Thank you.